Congress for it. And, uh, thanks to Jindong because he just introduced uh, the context or an application, which is an example of the, the sort of thing that I'm going to talk about. I'd like to take a little bit of a step back and just talk about um, why we want to annotate text in the first place, and then also um, look at some um, standardization efforts that are happening at the moment to try to link in with other um, annotation standards outside of the biomedical domain. I thought I would just start with a brief introduction to NICTA where I work, just because most of you probably aren't familiar with it. NICTA is National Information and Communications <laughs> Technology Australia. We are a publicly, publicly funded research institute um, in Australia, which has five different labs along the east coast of Australia, as you see there. We cross ICT research, information communication technology research, so we have everything, uh, we have a set of research groups that are listed here, including machine learning, control and signal processing, optimization, and so on. And then we have, uh, sorry, and then we have business teams, and um, essentially what happens is the business teams represent application areas for the research groups. Um, our work is in health, and um, I'm located in the Victoria Research Laboratory, which is in Melbourne. And um, it is the largest ICT research <coughs> center in Victoria with about 70 full-time um, staff, half of which are in the health and life sciences um, business area. We are very closely integrated with um, most of the universities in the state of Victoria. And um, um, so that means we, we basically have collaborative research projects with um, all of the universities listed there. Okay, so that's my brief intro. Um, so I just wanted to, to um, tell you something that you probably already know, but just to highlight the context that we're working in. So there's a lot of structured and unstructured data in biomedicine. And what we have here is very old, and I know from my footnote, I know the data is old, but it doesn't matter because the point continues. So the, just imagine that the plot, that the graph continues um, forward into today. But the basic point here is that there's a lot of data, and there's a lot more of it What we have on the left is, is uh, uh, sorry, on your right is equipment. And um, the number of publications in, in PubMed continues to grow tremendously. Um, so a lot of knowledge is locked in that text. And, and the real point, I think, for this community is that um, text is unstructured data. It's not directly computable. It's basically just strings of characters. And in order to interpret or provide meaning to that text, we have to do some sort of analytical processing. That analytical processing is complicated because text is um, uh, often ambiguous and specified. And the tool that we just saw is sort of one way to, to um, formally capture the, some of the meaning that's, that's, captured, uh, that's represented in that, in that text. So what we're trying to do effectively is get computers to, to do better at working with this unstructured information source. Um, we know that in the biomedical domain, this is extraordinarily relevant. Um, we heard the biocuration uh, talk earlier from Yervin, which is, which is uh, I think, really the point that there's a huge amount of data that's locked in um, to textual form, and it's a, a tremendous effort to, to keep up with that, and we basically aren't going to be able to. So the typical modern or model organism curation pipeline, which he highlighted, looks something like this. We select papers, we list genes in those papers for curation, we curate genes from, from the paper, and then we record those associations in a database. And at every step of the way, one can imagine, this is by and large a manual process at the moment, but one can imagine how we can use um, text mining or natural language processing or language technologies in general to help with these processes. So selecting papers is essentially uh, the computational task of information retrieval algorithms, listing genes for curation involving identity recognition, um, we, to do the curation to assign function to a gene, for instance, we would like to do some sort of relational or event extraction, and uh, ultimately we want to record it somewhere computationally. Um, the core techniques that we're using um, involve each of those things that we've highlighted. And ultimately what we're trying to do is extract <coughs> actionable data from the unstructured text that can be mined to, to unlock discoveries. A lot of work in um, Biomedical natural language processing takes advantage of um, what I would call hybrid machine learning approaches. And we really depend a lot on training sets that are annotated by domain experts. So essentially, we annotate some documents using a tool like Pub Annotation, and that provides the, the um, input to developing an algorithm that we can then use to generalize, build a model, and um, allow us to, in a high throughput manner, process a lot more text. So the training set that's annotated um, is the example that we're trying to emulate with our computational models. 
So just to put that in a nutshell, text annotation basically has, has two main objection, uh, objectives. One is on the input side to create training or test data for natural language processing algorithms, and the other is on the output side to allow us to build algorithms that enable us to automatically produce structured representations of the content of unstructured text. Um, so we're really, really worth building annotations and, and um, using annotations both at the input side and on the output side. Um, the kinds of annotations that we're talking about include things like linguistic structures. I'm oh, sorry, the color's not coming out very well. But um, we, we, we want to have perhaps um, some syntactic information about the, the, um, the particular part of speech of particular words in a, in a phrase. We might have um, a, a syntactic parse. We might have a dependency parse. Um, but this is the sort of information that we might want to capture. We'd like to start to capture more structured relationships. So we'd like to be able to formally capture um, um, the relationships that are expressed in here. In this case, there's a, a positive regulation event between GP41 and IL10. Um, but we want to capture that formula. So our algorithms are really about trying to convert that unstructured text there into some formal representation of the kind that we see here, which is hopefully tied to ontologies and, and really um, um, nicely given semantics that is then computable. Um, we want to be able to capture higher order relationships. So in this case, we have degradation of MDEM2 leads to an increased transcriptional activity of P53. And again, we want to be able to try to capture these um, higher order relationships between, between, in this case, the whole statement that, we're, that is of interest. Um, we may also want to add other information, experimental methods, the location in which these things, and again, we'd like to tie them to, to controlled vocabularies. So the sort of tool that we just saw, Pub Annotation, allows you to start to try to capture the entities and the relations and, and build up this annotation. This is another example of one that we've been working on um, called the Barium Annotation Corpus, which is about trying to capture genetic variation in cancer. Um, the shared tasks um, in the biomedical natural language processing community depend very heavily on, on sharing these annotations. And um, some examples I've listed here are the BioNLP Shares task, which uses the Genia corpus um, and is provided in RAT format, which is an annotation tool uh, format. Um, I think Genia mentioned RAT um, in this list. Uh, BioCreative is another shared task, which, which also requires um, distribution of the, of the training materials um, in a structured format. And more and more targeted corpora in this domain are being produced all the time. Genie again, we have BioIE, which is kind of an older one, but um, still out there. Uh, we released Craft last year, the Colorado Originally Annotated Full Text Corpus, which includes both linguistic annotation as well as um, semantic annotation of ontology concepts. Um, there's a, a, the National Library of Medicine has released a version of PubMed, which is fully um, um, annotated with metamap terms mapping into the MLS, and the list goes on, they're coming out all the time. Um, so I think one of the questions we have to look at is who are the consumers of all of these linguistic annotations? First of all, the creation of these linguistically annotated resources is a hugely expensive enterprise. Um, there are organizations all around the world that are funding these efforts, the Linguistic Data Consortium, the European Language Resource Association, NIST, all of these things are sort of um, um, institutions that have been developed around uh, storing and releasing corpora. And they're all essentially um, in an ad hoc kind of format. Each one of them uses a different, different representation. And I think that's because the community has typically focused on these resources as training uh, for specific tasks. And we're um, very good at evaluating the performance of particular tools trained on particular tasks. But we haven't really thought very carefully about how we might want to reuse those annotations and reuse those tools in other contexts or for other purposes. And I think this is something that's very obvious to the people in this room, but really what we want to be doing is to think about how we can reuse um, annotations in order to, to both allow us to link in with external semantic resources like the, the structured ontologies, um, but also to, to enable smarter um, processing, essentially, by, by building on, um, 
um, building on existing annotations and allowing us to have a more um, flexible interchange so that maybe if somebody is doing some sophisticated linguistic processing of a document, we can reuse that and not have to produce that ourselves. We do a lot of offline work in this world. And I think by pushing stuff out and sharing the information, we'll be um, able to do a lot more. Um, so the kinds of things that we're doing, a lot of the tools um, that people are familiar with, like the NCBO annotator, um, um, do take advantage of concepts in, in external ontologies. And they're, they're really about trying to associate some particular sub, subunit of text with a particular ontology concept. But we also want to think about these more, more sophisticated um, structures that exist in the text. So we have all these layers of linguistic annotation um, that I pointed out before. But you know, just kind of imagine a, a, a framework which allows you to capture these different kinds of, of um, linguistic annotations, all the way from the um, sort of orthographic sentential level up through to the, to the ontological level. Um, in Colorado, they built a system called the Open DMAP system, which is really about trying to take advantage of ontological constraints in um, the context of doing text mining in order to support um, um, constrained and um, smart information extraction systems effectively. And so this is an example of a system where using ontological constraints in combination with, with um, language technology or linguistic processing allows, drives um, a, a very high precision approach to doing information extraction. And these sorts of, the kinds of patterns you might imagine um, to find in an information extraction system um, cross all of these linguistic levels. So there's really a, a strong incentive to try to build an annotation representation which allows us to capture information both at the string level and at the part of speech tag level and at the semantic level. We really want to be able to define um, how information is expressed in text by, by crossing all of these um, different levels. Um, most annotation formalisms, as I said, are ad hoc and um, have been used to, to share these manually produced um, annotations. But there have been more recent efforts to try to, to generalize these. The most obvious example of this is something called LAP, the Linguistic Annotation Framework, seems to be the leading solution at the moment. And they've provided an XML serialization of LAP. And I won't go into all the details of LAP, but um, suffice it to say there are some issues in terms of the semantic um, uh, consistency of, of the linguistic annotation framework. And what we're trying to work towards is some alternative representations which fit in a bit better with the broader efforts in annotation. So I'd like to introduce you to something called the Open Annotation Model, which is um, being developed by a W3C community group, um, where the aim is to have a common RDF-based specification for annotating digital resources, plus providing tools for supporting the annotation of digital um, content. And one important point about this is that it's really not being developed initially with biomedicine in mind. In fact, the use cases that they've started with in open annotation came out of a whole range of scholarly annotation applications like annotating maps to the geographic um, information and um, um, annotating old manuscripts and, and artwork and so forth. So, um, but really what it's about is having a common framework for capturing metadata about any kind of web resource including including text. And so you can, you can um, imagine that this could be applied to something like tags, like in Flickr, or comments, like in Facebook, and really just have a, a standard representation. Um, we've been working to extend that to the biomedical text annotation context. The basic model in the open annotation framework um, is very simple. Um, basically, you have a, an RDF assertion, which is, is, is an annotation, which has two parts. It has a body. Oops. Sorry, it has a body and it has a, a target. Um, the target is, is, uh, is essentially the, the object of the annotation, the text or the, or the part of an image or the um, um, map that, that, that the annotation is, is um, about. And then the body is the actual content of the annotation. So um, if, you're, if your text is, is uh, if you've got a piece of text that's Apple and you've got some ontology identifier for apple the fruit, then, then um, target would be the text, and the body would be the ontology concept. Um, it also defines a specification for associating annotation metadata um, with the annotation itself. And so you, have, you, can, you can 
represent information like who, who created the annotation, um, whether it was generated automatically, um, what version um, of, of <coughs> system generated the annotation. Um, you can also define multiple targets for an annotation. So this allows you to represent things like discontinuous constituents or to have compare and contrast um, um, statements between different things. Um, and the main, the main characteristic, and I'm supposed to stop now, is that um, the annotation representation allows you to separate metadata about the annotation from both the content of the annotation itself and the resource um, being annotated. So it's a very nice um, um, basic model to, to build on. And we've been extending it in various ways, which I won't be able to tell you about, but we can talk about lots more this week. Um, and so um, really, the, the point I wanted to get across is that what this facilitates is, um, and what we're really looking for is a solution that enables interoperability of linguistic data with other possibly non-linguistic data, like all of these beautiful intelligent resources we have, to enable smarter text mining solutions and that the open annotation model might be a good um, starting point. And I think there's a lot more to be done. It's very high level, obviously, with the devil's in the details, but I think it's a nice place to start. So thank you. I'll put my phone up there.